5, Amos 5, just a, a quick recap uh, from last week, and, we're, and this is going to be quick, just uh, two things. Um, uh, one, in the verse, in the uh, kind of the middle verses of chapter 3, uh, we have this series of questions from God, and it, it uh, does a lion roar when the, in the thicket when there is no prey? Does a trap spring when, from the earth when there's nothing to catch? Does a trumpet sound in the city not tremble? Basically, that what he's saying is, is I speak. When I speak, do I have nothing to say? Now, that's just one kind of, one, if, you, if, you, if you collected anything from what we read last week, what we focused on last week, that's one of the two things I'd want, I want you to focus on because that's a lot of what uh, Amos is saying to the people of Israel, specifically at this point to the northern kingdom, is, is that God speaks. And if you are not paying attention, what you are assuming by your your own actions will testify against you. What you are assuming is is that he has nothing to say. How many people do you all hear in the din of yak that goes on all the time that you don't care, you don't listen to? There's a lot for me. There's a whole lot. I mean, I listen to a whole lot of stuff. But there's a lot that just doesn't rise to the merit of my attention. And I I I don't pay attention to it. Because that voice has nothing to say to me. You know, that's what we're telling God when God says, I speak. If I speak, do you honestly think I have nothing to say? And then the second piece, and this is the seminal scripture of Amos. I could, maybe I'm thinking about this just through my own set of eyes. I don't think I'm alone in this. This is the seminal scripture of uh, uh, verse, voice from the book of Amos. Prepare to meet your God. That's where we focused last week when we, when we focused on, on, uh, on essentially chapter 4, but we had to kind of grab out of chapter 3 also uh, to get to it. So I, I want to kind of resurface those two thoughts. When God speaks, God does indeed have something to say. It will serve us well to listen. And secondly, we should never live a moment of our lives under the misimpression that it is not the status of our life to be prepared to meet our God. That should happen. Now, we're going to see a, a, a kind of a third piece of that as, as we get into chapter 5 this morning. And I hate to think of these things as linear. Sometimes it's difficult not. But this isn't like uh, the book of Esther where it's a linear narrative of a linear piece of history. The book of Ruth, we have a linear piece of history that has a linear recording and unfolding the book. Uh, this isn't linear. However, some of these ideas that, that I, Amos is, 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 gosh, just forging into the lives of Israel, whether they'll receive it or not, which honestly they don't, we know that as a piece of history, but uh, forging into the lives of Israel, these are those points. So I want to now kind of just get step into um, uh, chapter 5, and I want to do it in in this manner. Um, You all have probably seen the bumper sticker or a t-shirt or some form of media that has this phrase in it. In a world that you can be anything that you choose, choose to be kind. Familiar with this? Have you seen this? Just briefly. So, uh, uh, and, and you get it, right? You, you, you understand kind of the, the encouragement of such a phrase. In a world that you can be anything that you choose, choose to be kind. Seems reasonable enough. However, I want to ask you to think about what's being said there. What kind of a worldview would, would anchor this seemingly benevolent encouragement, choose to be kind, on the premise of you live in a world where you can be anything you choose? Now, I don't want to discredit the intent of the author, but what kind of world tells you that you can be anything that you choose? I, and I, it, we live in a world today that has a very clear way to communicate that. It's called self-identification. I self-identify. What is self-identification? Oh, well, it's, 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 a, it's a means by which I'm totally entitled to that I get to determine what my reality is. And where did that come from? Oh, well, it came from um, the mean is the message, Marshall McLuhan in the late 50s was turned into, uh, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, in the late 80s, which is now turned into perception is reality. Your perception is your reality. You can choose to be whatever you want to be. You can self-identify. And I'm standing at the, uh, at the stove this morning, 
cooking some bacon with two uh, 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 very lustful dogs behind me. <laughs> and this thought came to me as I'm doing this. If I chose to be a lion and decided that I want to engage the fellowship of my brethren in a meeting with the lions, I would find out very quickly, and the lions would make this clear, that there's a difference between meeting time and lunchtime. They would not accept my reality that I'm one of them. They would make it very clear that I'm lunch, not a lion. Of course, for me, it would be way too late to make that uh, course correction and say, oh, well, maybe I'm not a lion. Maybe that my self-identification as a lion is, was maybe, maybe that was a little misguided. Well, it's a little late when I'm just the digesting you know, nourishment of a in a lion's belly. Reality is, is you do, we do not live in a world where you can be anything that you choose. There's a self-evident reality that stares all of us in the face and that if we attempt to live in a life like that, there are very real consequences for the choices that we make. And if I've, if I've used the word choice too many times this morning, it's intentional. Because when we live in a world where the, the, the ability to make the choice is more important than what choices we make, we become an agent of our own authority and a law unto ourselves. And that's how you cannot be the chairman of the lion committee in the den, but lunch for the lions. And you walked into it face up. You thought that the ways and means of the world, in a world where you can be anything that you choose, entitled you to do just that. Choose anything I want to be. That's the self-evident reality that plagues us today. That's the self-evident reality that plagues humankind throughout all of humanity. It just takes different forms. Self-identification is not a new thing. It's just the new way to express a very old disease of being human. And that is, I want to live life on my terms without consequences. Which is exactly the decision that was made in the Garden of Eden. Don't take of the fruit of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of what consequence is there? I want to live life on my own terms. I see the fruit. It's a good looking fruit. I think it's going to be pretty tasty. And if I eat of it, my eyes will be open and I'll be like God. So, in spite of the fact that the only voice that I've ever heard in my entire existence, the voice of my creator God, I'm going to listen to one sentence out of a talking snake and decide I'm going to self-identify as my own agent, as a free agent, under my own authority, and I'm going to take of the fruit. See, it's not new. It's very old. It's as ancient as, as, as human existence is. And yet, that's where we find ourselves. And if we're not careful, we buy into this idea. In a world that you can be anything that you choose, choose to be kind. Be kind. Yes, I mean, any of us are, are promoting the idea of cruelty as the, way, the path of life? No, none of us are promoting that idea. Even the anarchists really have a struggle with uh, coming to terms with the idea of the choose to be cruel. None of us choose that. So this idea of choice in your life... I, uh, um, uh, just briefly, another, another way that this, this finds its way into our lives. How many women do you hear out there with their little pink hats on, screaming, I want the right to choose, kill my baby? None, none of them. What are they saying? A woman's right to choose. That's what they're saying. I want to choose. I want to be able to choose to live my life on my own terms without consequences. That's, you know, but nobody, that's the easy sell. No, you can't sell, uh, you know, I want the right to choose to kill my baby. That doesn't sell very well. But you can sell the idea of choice because that's the world we live in. You're free to choose whatever you want to. Let's get into, uh, let's get into five here. Remember, Eli uh, Amos has come to them saying that God speaks 
do not abandon his voice in your life. And secondly, people of Israel, prepare to meet your God. I'm going to let the cat out of the bag real quick on the other end of that. Go to verse 18 of 5. Chapter 5, verse 18. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, and as though he entered his house to rest his hand on the wall only to be bitten by a stake. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without the day of brightness? It starts with a question from God. You all are under the very distinct and very disparaging impression that the day of the Lord is somehow illuminating wonderfulness for you. And it is not. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment. We, we, we read in scripture, the day of the Lord is the great and dreadful day. Understand what's being said in the great and dreadful day. For those who are redeemed, it is a great day. It is the fulfillment of our faith that we will, at, at, at now, our faith will have become sight, and we will see him as he is. But for the unredeemed, for the lost, for the rebellious of the world, it will be a very dreadful day. And what, is he, what, is, what does Amos say? Y'all are longing for the day of the Lord. It's a great and dreadful day. I got some shocking news for you. For you, northern kingdom. You king, you people, you rebellious people of Israel, it is a very dreadful day. So let's go back and look at what God is saying, because this is a, a as we read in uh, verse 1, hear, o Lord, uh, hear this word, O house of Israel, this lament I have concerning you. This is a lament. What I'm about to say to you is a lament. And here is the, here's the principal lament. Fallen is Israel, never again to rise, deserted in her own land with no one to lift her up. If you're familiar with the word Ichabod, you can sum up that whole verse with the word Ichabod. The Lord has left the temple. The Lord has left Israel. You have abandoned the Lord, O Israel, and now the Lord is going to abandon you. You have enjoyed the, 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 the pleasure of the garden as long as we walked in fellowship. But when you break fellowship, you won't die right away. You will ultimately die, but you will live apart from my fellowship. And that's what the Lord God is now creating, creating an answer to your, your, your desire. You wanna choose and you wanna live according to your own will, but you don't want the consequences. And you think what consequences do come you can manage. So. I'm going to show you what those consequences are. Let's look. Fallen is the virgin Israel, never to rise again, deserted in her own land with no one to lift her up. That's a preamble to what's next said. This is what the sovereign Lord says. The city that marches out a, strong, uh, a thousand strong for Israel will have only a hundred left, and a town that marches out a hundred strong will only have ten left. What he's making very clear is, is that um, y'all are unequipped to fight this battle. You've been doing battles for a long time. It's worked for you pretty well. You've built lots of allegiances. You've built a strong army. In fact, what you have built has engorged you with riches to the degree, as we have talked about in the past couple of weeks, where uh, uh, um, uh, you, you consume upon your own lusts and your own pleasure all that wealth can buy and have abandoned any accountability for yourselves or for others, such that you are perfectly willing to sell somebody into prison whom you have unjust authority over for just the, the value of a pair of sandals, which is nothing to you, you cows of Bashan, who lounge upon your sofas saying to your husband, bring us drinks. The price of, of sandals is nothing, but you're still willing to do it to increase your lot in life. That's the nature of deception that you have built. It's the nature of the world that you have built for yourself. This, this is hearkening back to last week. So you have, what he's saying here is, is that for the city that marches out for Israel, that's the, that's the key for Israel. This is your advocates. These are the people that, that you forged alliances with. These are the people that come to your aid. When somebody else is in trouble, you go help them. When you're in trouble, they come help you. Here's what's going to happen, Israel. You're going to get in trouble, and they're not going to be able to come to you because I'm going to intercede. When they march out in a thousand, I'm going to take... 990 of them. 
I'm, I'm sorry, 900 of them. 100 are going to return to say, we failed. When they march out in 100, I'm going to take 90 of them. 10 are going to return and say, we have failed. You have no advocate. That's what God is saying. Is this that when you have, you have come to do spiritual battle to me, thinking that you can do battle with me with the, or the weapons of men, and I will thwart that to the degree that only a tiny fraction of those who will come to your aid will live to go back and say we failed. But you, O oh Israel, have no advocate. This is where it's just you and me over the table to reconcile this I have against you, this lament I hold against you. And so he gives them, and this is a remarkable thing, he gives them the out. God never pins us into a corner brings us pain, brings us discomfort, brings us challenge, turns up the heat in our lives without a way out. He gives us a way out, but it's one door, and it's him. That's it. You have only one way out from your rebellion, and that is through the door of me. You have to come to me. And this is not rocket science. If you're, if you're seeking justice, do you not go to those who offer justice? If you're seeking a job, don't you go to those who, give, who offer jobs? This is not rocket science. If you're seeking reconciliation, don't you go to the one who, with whom which you have ought? So, the Lord says, O house of Israel, seek me and live. I want to take us back to Deuteronomy for a second. Deuteronomy 30. And, and, and we'll do this, this quickly. But I find that I, I, I find very little anchor in Scripture that I don't find its, its anchorage in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. Now what I'm commanding you, this is Moses speaking, now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you uh, or beyond your reach. Uh, first thing, it, this, this is exactly what Amos is saying to Israel. If this is not too hard for you to get. I'm sorry, what God is saying through Amos to Israel. So this is God speaking to, to Israel in Amos. This is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up to the, in, the, in the heavens so that you have to ask or who can ascend to the heavens and get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea and get it and proclaim it to us that we may obey it. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth. It is on your heart so that you may obey it. And I said it before you. Today, life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Get that sequence. Get that sequence. This is way back in Deuteronomy. This should be an anchorage in our lives as, as Israelis, as Christians. But we're, we're, we're talking about the Israelis in, in Amos. I set before you life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, decrees, and laws. Those three things. We're going to see those three things come up in Amos here in just a minute. And then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you. I'm sorry? Okay. I'm looking at 30, verse 1. You're in 30, 15. I'm in 15 now. Yeah, did I not say verse 11? I'm sorry. We started in verse 11. We started in verse 11. <laughs> Sorry about that. I get, I, I, I get excited and I, and, I, and I forget to say everything I want to say. Uh, but if your hearts turn away from me and you are not obedient and if you are drawn away and bow down to other gods and worship then, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are possessing across the Jordan to, in, uh, to enter to uh, possess. This day I call upon heaven and earth as witness against you and I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now choose life Highlight the word choose. This is your choice. You can make this. It was given to you not by your choice to have this choice, but by God who is giving you this choice. And what is the choice? Follow me and live. Rebel against me and die. It's your choice. Having the choice is not nearly as important as the choice that you make. I set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God and listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he has swore to give unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I don't know a better way to say any of that. It's fairly simple. 
the choice is yours. God is giving you the choice. It's not your choice. It's his choice that he's giving you. You make the choice that he gives you. And the choice is really simple. This is not so high that somebody say, ascend into the heavens and the stars. And somebody go up there and find this, this answer and bring it down to us. Or in the deep, that somebody say, cross the seas and somebody, you know, get this answer. No, it's right in front of you. Life and death. Not a, not a whole lot of us are just like chomping at the bit to choose death. We choose life. We choose peace. We choose prosperity. We choose to be at, uh, at, um, uh, at least not at enmity with anyone else. But certainly we choose peace. And yet, Israel now has to be formally told in back to uh, Amos 5, verse 5, and Please, 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 do. it's really easy for us. This is why I started the way I did. It's really easy for us to say, uh, you know, stupid Israelis. I mean, how, in the, how, how, how can you not get this? How can you not understand this? The whole reason I started the way I did this morning is to say that with, with, a, with, with a blindness from eyes wide open, we live in the exact same world. It has infected us such that we can actually see a sign that says, in a world that you can choose to be anything that you want, choose to be kind. And think, oh, what a benevolent humanism. What a, what a wonderful thing to say. What a great encouragement. We, everybody should be walking around telling each other in the world that to be anything you choose, choose to be kind. It all sounds really great until you really ask yourself, from what world view does that even come? It's our world. Don't be so quick to say, Oh my gosh, why did you not get seek me and live? What part of seek me and live don't you get? Remember those three things that we just read in Deuteronomy. The first thing, seek me and live. That's the very first thing God told the Israelites in, in, in Deuteronomy in that passage where Moses is about to cross into the Jordan. He's reminding them of all of the great things that, that the Lord has done for them. And then he distills it to this. Don't rebel against me. You rebel against me. You do not have peace and you don't have the land. You will not live there longer, any longer because I will remove you. It's not that, that, that you'll just blow it. I will remove you. Seek me and live. Now, this is the first of three uh, seeks, or first of three choices that you'll make. This, uh, the first one is verse 5, seek me and live. The second one is verse 6, seek the Lord and live. And the third one is verse 14, seek good, not evil, that you may live. Any kind of common theme in that you will live <laughs> seek me seek the Lord seek good not evil and you will live you will live you will live if you want to live if you want to live at peace if you want to live and, and and know that he's not just talking about and if you don't you die today it's that you look you will live eternally that's the great gift the great gift is not that you live today remember death is a gift it is the only means by which this barrier between us and God can be bridged. He gave it to us as a, as a path home. It is a means, but it's the means by which God gave us a way home. Seek me and live is not just live today, it's live eternally. So hear what he has to say. Don't, um, and the first one is a prohibition. Seek me and live. Do not go to seek Bethel. Don't go to Gagal. Don't journey down to Beersheba. For Gagal will surely go into exile, and Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Now you notice that they didn't say anything about Beersheba. So this is God speaking. God's enlisted three kind of communities that he says don't go to. It's probably worth asking, what's he talking about? What he's talking about. Uh, Bethel, you got one on that? Why would God say don't go to Bethel? Calf. This is the northern kingdom. Bethel and Dan, those are the two locations that Jeroboam placed the two golden calves and said, here's your Lord, here's your Savior, this is the one who brought you up out of Egypt. You don't have to go down there to uh, uh, Jerusalem with the, those, those, those hicks in the south uh, and go to the temple of Jerusalem. I got a handle on it for you. Here we got, we got cows here. You can go to Bethel or Dan. Bethel, don't go to, Dan, don't go to Bethel. That's what he's talking about. Don't go to this pollution of the, uh, of the self-revelation that I gave you that you made of the self-revelation that I gave you. you. I gave you a self-revelation of me. You polluted it. You turned it into golden cash. You put one of these two. This is all a part of that manufactured religion. If you remember when we talked about this, we
up, you, you start hanging out with those southern guys, you're back to the temple, you fall in your own lace, and the northern kingdom will lose all of its influence and power and people, because everybody's going to head back south. Don't, you don't have to do that. Don't go to Bethel. Don't go back to the pollution of my self-revelation that you created. And then he says, Gilgal. Don't go to Gilgal. There's a, there's a huge amount about Gilgal. One, the thing that you'll have in common with all these references to Gilgal is, is that at one time, it was a place where significant events of the Lord's self-revelation happened that now idols to foreign gods are set up in. And they have become places of rebellious idolatry throughout. This is Gilgal. All of these great things that happened there, you've espunged from your minds. And instead, you've set up temples to your, the, your manufactured gods. So first, don't go to this place of my self-revelation revealed to you specifically and that you replaced it with your own creation. And do not go to the, foreign, the sites of the foreign gods. Don't go there either. Because you will not, remember what, remember what all this is under, the, under the, uh, the construct of? You don't have any advocates. Your first, your first thought of your advocates is the other nations that you made treaties with. So when you're in trouble, they'll come to your eyes. You know, that's not the battle we're fighting. Quite frankly, we're fighting a battle of the spirit between you, Israel, and me. So when we fight a battle of the spirit, you're going you're gonna to turn. Don't turn to Beersheba. Don't turn to Gilgal. Don't turn to Bethel. And then Beersheba... That's, uh, that was where uh, um, uh, Abraham uh, had, uh, um, gosh, forgive me, forgive me. That, that was a significant event in Abraham's life, and it's just getting my mind. Bottom line is, Beersheba was a pilgrimage city because of this event in Abraham's life, which is just get my mind. But it was a pilgrimage city. Don't think that, that appeasing me, finding peace with me, communicating with me, or for that matter, doing battle with me, is, a, is, is related to geography. Remember we talked last week for a minute, the, the uh, Samaritan woman at the well, her position about truly worshiping God was a position of geography. Here in Samaria, by Jacob's well, which is what our fathers tell us for, the authentication is our father, the worship is at, at, at this, in this piece of geography. Jesus says, no, it's neither in the south nor in the north, but it's in worship and spirit and truth. That's what the father is asking for. Beersheba was one of those places where geography controlled the idea of what it meant to, to communicate with God. So it's not geography, it is not your, uh, uh, your uh, manufactured gods, and it is not the gods of this world to turn. Seek me and live. Verse 6. Seek the Lord and live. The first one, seek me and live your way. I, I'm, I'm characterizing this a, a little bit to help us a little bit. Um, what, the, the way that you are to walk is to seek me and live. That's the way you are to walk. The second, seek, seek the Lord and live. This has to do with the consequences. It's again, the, way I, the reason I wanted to start the way I did this morning is because you all are under the impression that you can live lives free of consequences. That you're entitled to choose whatever way or means of life that you want to live and that the consequences are at least manageable or, or inconsequential. And there is nothing about our existence that God says, oh, the consequences are incidental. Yeah, I, I really, I'm, I'm your creator God, but I really don't care, you know, what choices you make because, you know, honestly, it, you know, it, it's incidental. It's not a big deal. No. What does he say about the consequences of a, a life of piety and a life of rebellion? What hangs in the balance? He said it in Deuteronomy. He said it here. Martha, you, or, or Marcia, you're, you're mouthing it. No. Life and death, yes. It's not, it's not inconsequential. This is life and death. There is nothing more consequential. This is the consequentiality that my dogs were yakking at me about this morning. No, you choose to self-identify as a lion. You're going to find out really quick that there's a difference between meeting time and lunchtime. Your self-evident reality will, 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 will bear itself in your face very quickly. That's what God is saying to Israel is, is you don't get to live without consequences. Seek the Lord and live, or he will sweep through like an oar. See the word or? Or he will sweep through 
the house of Joseph like a fire, and it will devour, and Bethel will have no one to quench it. Now, this is a really cool piece. I'm going to read it a little differently, and then I'm going to put it back together the way Scripture puts it together, but I, I, I'm doing this for a point. And the, and the, and the group that I'm going, to, I'm going to take on here is verse 7 through verse 10. And so this is how I'm going to do it. Verse 7 and 10 I'm going to put together, and then 8 and 9 I'm going to put after that. So this is where I'm going to read it. You turned uh, justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. You hate the one who reproves in court and despise him who tells you the truth. Now the reason I do that is because those are the two verses of you. This is how you see the world. O Israel, O fallen Israel with no advocate fighting a battle that you have no idea how to fight. That you turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. You hate the one who reproves in court and despise he, him who tells the truth. The nature of your existence is, is that you want your life by your choice on your means of this uh, kind of Frank Sinatra idea, I did it my way, unconsequentially. And you hate people to step into your life and tell you the truth. That rubs you the wrong way. The truth is not what you want to hear. What you want to hear is that you get to choose. You get to live whatever life you want and you're not accountable for it. But then the voice of accountability steps in and that's what's sandwiched between these two. So let's read it in, its, in, its, in the way that scripture orders it. You who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground he who made the Pallades and Orion, who turns blackness into dawn and darkness into uh, to night, who calls the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land, the Lord is his name, and he flashes destruction on the stronghold, and he brings the fortified city to a ruin. I gotta finish, sorry. You hate the one who reproves in court and you despise him that tells you the truth. That's what, that's what he's saying. That's, that's why it's ordered this way. I needed to read it uh, with uh, seven and 10 to get kind of my side what God is telling me, and then hear what he says in between. But I, I want to keep it in the, in, the, in the order that Scripture offers it, and that is that uh, you who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground, here's what you're facing. The one who made the Palladines and the Orion, who turned blackness into the, 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 all of the stars of the heavens. These, the, the, those two are, are anchors because... I won't go into it, but they're gravitationally bound constellations. There, it's, there's a kind of uniqueness in those two, uh, but we, we won't go into that. But the God who made those, the God who turns blackness into dawn, the, 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 and uh, I'm sorry, darkness into uh, uh, day into night, who calls uh, those who, who, I mean, who orders your day? All he's saying is his sunrise and sunset. You take it for granted, Israel, but your sunrise and your sun, sunset, that's me at work. That one whom you hate that tells you the truth, that's me at work. That's true. You take it for granted every day. You think it's, it's, it's an irrelevancy. Can you, can you even begin to list the ways that your life would be different if there wasn't a solar cycle on this planet? If it was always day or always night? Who does that? This was the, this, my mind goes into to crazy things. And, and a couple of days ago I was reading this and I'm saying, well, exactly what does make the earth rotate on its axis? What's the fuel? What's the power that makes the earth rotate on its axis? It's been rotating on its axis ever since it was formed. So what keeps that rotation going? And I saw, I did a lot of research on it and I read lots and lots and lots of tracks and the reality of it is nobody knows. Everybody's got a lot of theories about it but nobody knows. It, 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 it ranges from, it's always been that way, so that's the way it does. This is, this is science, too. This is the, these are the great uh, intellectual minds of our, of our time. They're saying that it's always been that way, and there's no, no resistance of force in the universe, and so uh, it just, it, since it's always been rotating, it just continues to rotate. It doesn't have to have any fuel. And another one says, oh, no, no, it's the iron molten core. The iron molten core is constantly rotating, and every about a million and a half years or so, it starts rotating the opposite directions. When that happens, hurricanes happen, and tidal waves happen, and tsunamis happen, and the Earth's destroyed, and every, uh, life starts all over again on this. Yeah, you, you know, you, you get into to science, and as soon as you start grabbing a thousand years, ten thousand years, a millennia, ten million years, one hundred and fifty billion years, you know, credibility starts dropping through the body. Nobody knows, but God's saying, "Sunrise and sunset, that's my hand at work." You take it for granted every day. You think it doesn't make any difference. You think it's you think you're entitled to it. You who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. Where did your justice come from? me 
I revealed myself to you and I revealed my law to you and I called you to live within my law. And it was done for your good. Remember, the Ten Commandments are not prohibitions, they're preservation. This is for your good. I give you this law to live by for your benefit. The Lord is his name. He flashes destruction upon the stronghold. He brings down the fortified city to ruin. Look, if I can walk on water, if I can make it, if I can turn it into wine, I can certainly tear down your cities. It's not a big issue. When you do battle with me, you think you're doing battle with swords of men, and you're not. It's a spiritual battle. But I'll reveal myself in a way that you can understand it. All those uh, 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 allied cities and nations that you form with, no, I'll crush them. It's what I said in the first one. They're going to march out in thousands, and only hundreds are going home. They're going to march out in hundreds and only tens are going home. They're not going to come to your aid. You don't have any advocate. The consequences of the way you live your life, the decisions that you make, the choices that you make, you are accountable to me, which is really going to be the third one that we get into here in just a second. You trample the poor and you force them to give you grain. It, uh, give you grain. It, essentially what that is is grain tax. It's not just grain. You, you, uh, you force him to give you, who are wealthy, tax on the meager sustenance that sustains life for them. This is how you eke from the poor. This is your disregard for other human beings. Therefore, you have built stone mansions, in, but you're not going to live in them. And you thought you planted, yes, lush vineyards, but you're not going to drink from the wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great are your sins. You oppress the righteous and you take bribes and you deprive the poor of justice in the courts. This is like one of the multiple times we keep hearing this issue of justice come up. Therefore, the prudent man keeps quiet in such times uh, for the times are evil. And this is kind of a tough one. Therefore, the prudent man keeps uh, quiet in these evil times. Now, in one sense, we'd say, well, is, aren't you supposed to take a stand in, in, in times of injustice where you see injustice? Aren't you supposed to take, take a stand? And what God is saying here is that the world that you all have created in this kingdom is so oppressive and so abusive and so devoid of any rationale that right has been called and wrong has been called right, that good and evil have been inverted. You have no distinction between the sacred and the profane. Your lives are so inverted that the one prudent man, the one who might uh, tell you the truth, he will hold his tongue. Because it will be, as Christ described, and and I'm making a, a New Testament connection here, uh, as casting pearls before swine. He's going to hold his tongue because you have no capacity to even understand what he will tell you. He will tell you that, no, you don't have a right to kill your children. But that's not going to make any sense to him. Well, of course I have a right to kill my children. It says so right there in the Constitution. Because that's where my rights come from. It's in the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. I've got a, I got a right to... Of course, yeah. No, it doesn't. But that doesn't make any difference. It makes no sense. Oh, sure, you can just choose to be whatever you want to be. Self-identify. Go at it. The consequences will prove you a liar. But it doesn't make any sense. The prudent will not even, not even raise his voice in opposition any longer. It is, it is without, without merit. Now, we're, we are not going to go where our book has us next week. Uh, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to focus, but as a, as a kind of preview of things to come, where we're going to focus is uh, chapter 8, verse 11. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine throughout the land, not a famine for food or thirst or water, but a famine for the hearing of the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for a word from the Lord, but they will not find it. That's what I'm sending on you. You all have thought you could live apart from my word, apart from my law, apart from my self-revelation, apart from my abiding presence. I'm going to show you what that's like. We're not there yet, but I'm going to show you what that's like. And then we get to the third seek. Seek good, not evil, that you will live. Then the Lord Almighty will be with you. If... if, if if you, if, you, if you don't see that connection, it, it's, it's the connection of abiding. If you want to hear it in first person, if you will seek good and not evil, first, you're going to live, and second, I will abide with you. There will be peace between us. All of the, 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 the great things that I have done for the nation that I 
created out of one man Abraham and cultivated and shaped and blessed and grew up into this nation that you take all the credit for now, I will again abide with you. And this is the killer. Just as you say he did. Now that's, that's, that's put in second person. The Lord Almighty will, will, will be with you just as you say he is. You hear what he's saying? You say, hey, look. The, the sanctuary is full. The offering plates are overflowing. And the, the church is building a new, uh, a new family life center. Surely the Lord is with us. Uh, our enemies, they, they, you know, they, they run from us. Neighboring nations, they pay tribute to us. We, uh, uh, we live in a culture where silver is as plentiful as the dust of the streets. I'm borrowing from, from the description from uh, Solomon's reign as king. When we bow down to these other gods, we had uh, um, uh, plenty of food, plenty of wine, and none of our enemies attacked us. Don't come to us. This is uh, um, uh, Lamentation. Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah. I remember uh, four weeks or so ago, we brought Jeremiah into this conversation where Israel was rebelling in, in particular ways, and Jeremiah was calling to count the very specific ways they were rebelling. And the one of the very specific ways they were rebelling is, is that in all of the way we choose to live, everything is fine. Don't come at us with this yak about us violating the, the, the will of the Lord when look at my wallet, look at my mansion, look at my vineyard. Things are going pretty well. What God say? Therefore you have built stone mansions and will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink from them. Everything that you think that, that is an indicator that God is with you is not an indicator that God is with you. It's an indicator of your own self-absorption. This is why he says, Then the Lord Almighty will be with you just as you say he is. You say he is, but he is not. That's why all of this is being said. You have inverted right and wrong and good and evil and sacred profane to such a degree that you don't know which way is up anymore. And the biggest problem is, is not that you don't know, it's that you don't know you don't know. You think the way you live is pleasing to the Lord, and yet it is your bending destruction. So, seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord Almighty will be with you. You'll actually know the abiding presence of God if you will do this. Then you, you, you hear this from, uh, from Job. It was the characterization of Job. Hate evil and love good. The, 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 the characterization that God proclaimed upon Job before anything happened was the nature of Job is a man who loved God and shunned evil. That was the characterization that God gave Job. That's what, that, thank you. That's the characterization God's given us. We're going to move quickly here. I hate, ev uh, hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord, Almighty, uh, Lord God Almighty will have mercy on you and a remnant of Joseph. What he's doing is giving you that way out. Seek me and you'll live. Seek the Lord, meaning the, 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 the consequences of living, the way the Lord, that's what we've, we've been unfolding here, it's consequences the way the Lord has led us, and you will live and seek good. This is where the rubber meets the road. Speak him spiritually, seek him effectively in your life. Seek good, not evil. Administer justice in your course. Therefore, this is what the Lord God Almighty says. There will be a wailing in all the streets and cries of anguish in every public square. The farmers will be summoned to weep. The mourners will wail. There will be wailing in all the vineyards when I pass through in your midst, meaning the, the, the sweeping hand of the jaw of the Lord is coming in destruction. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. This is, where we, this is one of those bookends we started with. Woe to you who uh, long for the day of the Lord. That day will be as darkness, not light. It will be uh, as though man fled from a lion only to be met by a bear. That's almost a, a humorous uh, 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 image to, to put in your head. Uh, or a man will run into his house to, to rest in, on the wall and a snake will bite his hand. That day will of the Lord is darkness, not light. Pitch dark, not uh, without a ray of uh, dry, uh, brightness. Now, he'll go on here and we, do, we just have to, to, to close here. I'm sorry that we're, he'll go on. But he'll go on here with this Isaiah 1 type uh, um, uh, definition of the invented worship you have, I hate. You have created these, these, this noise of your song and the music of your harps. And, and he gets to this point. Now, this is the one that, that most people know from Amos. Let justice roll like a river and righteousness ne uh, a never-failing stream. 
What do you see? What, I mean, clearly after seek me and live, seek me and live, seek good, not evil, and live, the nature of your lives should be marked by personal righteousness and from that righteousness, justice in the land. Well, a reflection of me. We've got to, we've, I'm sorry, we've got to close here. I, there's more to go, but we just, we're, we're out of time. Thoughts before we close? He ends that. Therefore, I will send you into exile. Yeah, you, you, you made your, okay, yeah, I didn't know if you were, were going to make, you made your choice. Yeah. Because you won't, I'll send you to exile. Now, there's always a remnant, as, as, as we know, there is always a remnant. Uh, he has told them that there will be a remnant, uh, it, but if, if it, it is for those who choose and are, are abiding in the consequences of those choices. Uh, any other thoughts before we close? I'm I sorry, I will push it. It also shows the power of materialism and contentment in that how that will pull you away. Yeah, the deceptive power. Very good. Very good. The deceptive power of materialism and self-contentment. Blinds you. Blind you. Yes. Dissuades you from even processing the distinction between the sacred and the profane any longer. That's that. I so appreciate that. Other thoughts before we close this morning? Jock, could you close us in prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to be in this class. We Thank you for time. We uh, we, we um, seek to seek you, Lord, and uh, we need to be reminded of that constantly, Lord. That uh, there's nothing greater to do than to seek you in our lives, to seek you in everything that we do. Lord. We just pray that we'll obey you. We pray that other people will see us doing that, and that they will uh, have discernment and decide to seek you as well. Lord. We pray that you'll be with us this week, Lord, and again we. Uh, Pray that we will be, that we will 